Okay, then good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to our international online seminar on interval methods and control engineering. And today we have Michelle Kiefer with us, who is a full professor in signal processing for communications with the University Paris Saclay in France. And yes, I think he's very well known to most of the audience since he has already given one presentation in the seminar series last year in November. And yeah, he's especially interested during his research activities in signal processing for multimedia communications and networking, distributed source coding, network coding, joint source channel coding and decoding techniques. And especially also yeah, he's served as an associate editor of signal processing since 2008. Uh, yes, and has been associate editor of the IEEE Transactions and Communications from 2012 to 2016. And now we're looking forward to your talk on bounded error target localization and tracking using a fleet of UAVs. Michel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for attending this uh, seminar. Well, this is a joint work with... Uh, uh, two very good PhD students, Julius Ibental, uh, who is now he's now at uh, Volkswagen, um, and uh, Maxim Zagar, uh, will who will defend um, in uh, December, and uh, there's also some joint work with uh, colleagues at uh, Detis uh, Onera. This is uh, uh, one of the French uh, research agency for. Uh, uh, control of uh, airplanes, the missiles, etc. So Luc Meyer, uh, Ellen Pietlanier, and uh, Sébastien Renault. So the, the context of this work, we are trying to address the problem of cooperative search acquisition and tracking of uh, an a priori unknown number of targets. And uh, we are trying to estimate the target location and the perform persistent tracking of the detected targets, and we'll focus on the, the CSET problem using a fleet of uh, UAVs. So, a priori, we are searching an, uh, an a priori unknown number of targets. These are marks here by, by these black dots using a fleet of UAV. We are considering bounded perturbation and the measurement noise. And uh, here, in this first part of the talk, we will consider the presence of decoys. These are the dots here, white dots, inter which may be interpreted as targets when uh, observed under specific conditions. So our objective is to develop a set membership localization and tracking approach. We have to evaluate the sets which are containing the actual states of the already detected targets. We have to account for the presence of decoy and uh, for the presence of uh, uh, from uh, neighboring UAVs in order to design a cooperative and distributed control scheme for a fleet of drones. So I will present some related work. So this uh, CSAT problem, this is a task of collecting the information and we have to define also strategies. And most of the time, the hypothesis that are considered is that the measurement noise is considered as a random process and outliers on decoy are accounted for by uh, introducing some false alarm probability. But, well, we feel that this is not fully realistic. And uh, we have introduced more geometric observation condition under which uh, we may either identify an, an outlier or consider that the outlier is uh, not uh, a target to be followed. So various surf strategies has to be, have been developed. Uh, such as optimal flight path design, distributed model predictive control, gain theoretic approaches, and uh, there is really much, much more recent work um, here. So what I said is that usually the search process is based on probabilistic information, and it has been shown in uh, GU uh, that uh, the performance is very sensitive to the a priori probability distribution function, uh, which is considered to describe First, the processed noise and the measurement noise. And to overcome this issue, in order to avoid all these uh, probability distribution functions describing the noise, we have considered a set membership description of the uncertainty. And uh, here, the, the noise and the uncertainty are represented by 
bounded realizations. And instead of having a single point estimate, what we would like to have are set estimates. So there are several preliminary results of this work that have been uh, published uh, here. This is a, an Automatica paper in uh, 2021. And afterwards, I'll show you uh, more recent results where I try to integrate the um, information coming from a computer vision system. So I will first formulate the problem. So we have a fleet of NU UAVs, and uh, we consider moving targets here, the black dots, uh, and the environment is cluttered by decoys, and here, these are the decoys. So we assume that the time is sampled with a period T. This is a UAV state. We assume that we have some knowledge about, uh, we, we master the evolution of the UAV states, and here, this is a possible control input of the UAVs. This is a target state, and the targets are evolving according to some unknown. Um, the, 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 the dynamic is known, but there is some relatively large stair, stair perturbation that is unknown. The decoys here have been considered as static, but uh, this really readily extends to uh, moving decoys. So one very important uh, notion is the field of view. So we assume that uh, UAVs are equipped with optical seekers and they are, that they are able to get some information in the field of view of their seeker. Here, this field of view is defined by this um, square. And uh, an important aspect is that once I have a target in the field of view, I'm able to collect a measurement and to get the index J of the target. So uh, there is no non-detection. If you have a target in the field of view, we assume that we are able to detect it. For the decoys here, the hypothesis is a little bit more sophisticated. Here we have a decoy and here the decoy is detected provided that the decoy is in the field of view and moreover, then some observation condition is satisfied. Here in gray, these are the area for the UAV location where uh, the decoy can be detected. What does detected mean? It means that the decoy is observed and confused with a true target. Here, for example, we are not the, the UAV is not in the gray area and the decoy is not detected. It is not confused with a, a true target. If we detect a decoy or um, a true target, we are able to, to, to obtain an observation here for, of the, the state of the target. The observation ideally would depend on the relative location of the UAV and of the target. And we assume that uh, uh, this observation is corrupted by some noise. So here in this first part of the talk, we assume that we have directly access to the state of the target plus some noise. And uh, we'll see a little bit later some more realistic observation uh, uh, measurement equation, some measurement equation. So we assume that W remains bounded in some uh, bound with uh, uh, some interval with known bounds. So UAVs are also able to communicate. I assume that the two UAVs, when they are in vicinity, they are able to communicate uh, quite a lot of information. Here, I assume that they are able to communicate their state values, their list of known targets, their set estimates. But the communication has a limited range. And uh, we assume further that uh, the communication is performed without delay and uh, without error. So now we'll consider how the set estimates are evolving and first define this set estimate. What we will consider mainly are two set estimates. The set estimate here in green, this is for the target. And the set estimate in yellow, uh, this is the, the area which has still to be explored. And uh, this is the area which may contain pot, pot, uh, possible states of uh, the targets which were not yet detected. And uh, here, the green area may contain true targets, but also decoys, because we are confusing 
the true targets with uh, so, so some decoys with true targets. So at the beginning, we are assuming that everything the search area is entirely yellow, and um, we are trying to identify the location of the true target and uh, to eliminate the decoys. And uh, we'll use a generalization of a recursive set membership state estimator, which alternate a prediction step, a correction step from uh, measurements, and also a correction step from uh, uh, information provided by the other UAVs, which have evaluated their own estimates. And so at the initialization, we have the list of targets, which is empty, the list of uh, estimates for the targets, which is also empty, and this is the area which has still to be explored and which is the entire area, search area. So we start with the first, this is a prediction step. So I assume that at time k, I have some set containing a possible location for target G. And uh, using the dynamic of uh, the targets, I'm able to obtain an inflated set, which accounts for the evolution of uh, the uh, target. We can do exactly the same for the unexplored set, because the target within this unexplored set are also moving. I have to enlarge between for during the prediction step, I have to enlarge this set in order to get the new uh, set estimate corresponding to the unexplored area where target may still be possible. Now I have to take into account the measurements. So here, this is a field of view, sorry. This is a field of view of the UAV. And if I do not observe any target within the field of view, since there is no non-detection of target, I'm able to remove from the yellow set, I'm able to remove the uh, area covered by the field of view. Now we have to consider the situation where within the field of view, I'm detecting a target. For example, assume that I'm detecting here the, the target here in green. So accounting for the measurement uncertainty, I'm able to get a small area around the location uh, I've observed where I've observed the target to account for the new position. If I assume that the observation condition is also satisfied for decoys, I have the, a similar array, uh, area in the yellow set corresponding to the location of the decoy, which is potentially also a location of the target. And additionally, since here I'm not sure that I'm observed, I, I have observed at that point a decoy or the true target. I have also to account for the fact that the remaining part here in green could contain the true target. So I have also in my updated estimate to keep the part here for which I have no information at time k plus one. So I have to combine these three estimates in order to get my updated state estimate. Uh, so x k plus one knowing k plus one, where I've introduced, where I've taken into account the measurements provided by the uh, UAV i. Afterwards, I can take into account the information coming from the communications, and uh, I assume that at the end of step uh, k, UAV a once it has taken into account its measurements is able to communicate to its neighbors. So the target set, est uh, set estimates, these are all the estimates in green that I just computed, and also the unexplored area. And UAV I will receive the corresponding set from its neighbors. And now we have to see how we can combine, fuse the information coming from the sensor, so from the others. In order to facilitate this fusion, I will introduce a new set. This is a set which has proved not to contain any state of any target. This is a white set here. The white set corresponds to the part which has been explored and um, uh, for which we did not find any target. And since the detection probability is equal to one, the non-detection probability is equal to zero, I can say that there is no target in that area. 
So this is the information which is provided by, which is available to UAVI. This is the information that is available regarding the same area for UAVL. If I can, if I did not detect any target here, the um, to obtain the explored area where there is no target, I have simply compute the union. And for the yellow set, the area still to be explored, uh, I simply compute the intersection of both sets in yellow. When a target has been detected, assume that uh, UAV I has detected target here in Z place, UAV L has detected target J at Z place. Now we can do in a similar way the fusion. So the set in yellow and the set in white are exactly the same. Here, for the set in green, for Z part of the set in green, what I can remove here is Z part here, Z little part, because it has been proven by UAV I not to contain any target. So this is a way the fusion is performed and uh, by combination of measurements coming from, of information coming from uh, several UAVs. Now we have to perform some cooperative control design. So the main idea is to minimize the estimation uncertainty and uh, we have to define this uh, estimation uncertainty. So each UAV has access first to L, this is a list of targets. This is a list of set estimates for the target which, has to be, which have been detected. And X bar, this is the yellow set here, still to explore. And what you have to do is to each UAV has to determine a sequence of control inputs in order to minimize the estimation uncertainty. And the way we define the estimation uncertainty, first, we evaluate phi of x. This is the area of the green set. And we evaluate the average of the green sets uh, for all detected targets. This is the uncertainty, which is the estimation uncertainty, which is related to already detected targets. And for the remaining part, I take into account the part of the state space that has still to be explored. And uh, this is phi of uh, the, the measure of the yellow set. And here I put a weighting factor which tunes the relative importance of uh, exploring, re exploring, tracking the already detected targets and continuing to explore. Uh, so here with lambda large, you favor exploration. And with lambda small, you favor exploitation of uh, the already detected targets where we want to have a relatively precise location. So what we have considered is a model predictive control approach that has been adapted to our set membership estimation context. So I will start with a one step ahead prediction, but the H step ahead prediction follows us exactly the same lines. So we assume here in this work that uh, we are already a subset here of the neighbors of um, UAVI who have already evaluated their control inputs and their, uh, we assume that they are uh, transmitting their own control input to UAVI. And uh, we assume that during the um, prediction horizon, over the prediction horizon, we assume that the communication graph remains constant. Uh, and so now we have to see how the evaluation is performed. So this is this is a predicted uh, field of view. If I consider a given control input, I'm able to determine the predicted field of view of UAV L and of UAV I. Okay. Then I cannot say whether. I will be able to detect a new target or to see again an already, tar uh, an already detected target. So I will assume in this model predictive control uh, framework that I do not detect new target. And the only thing I'm able to do is to reduce the size of the yellow set using the field of view. And since the size of the yellow set in most of the time, this is the main part of uh, the contribution to the, it mainly contributes to the estimation uncertainty. So the assumption is not too bad. 
similarly for the green set again i'm never sure that i will be able to detect the um, the target again so i assume that I'm only able to uh, remove some parts. The parts that will be observed within the field of view will be removed from the grid set. So this is the, the main idea of uh, this model creative control approach. I only account for the part that I will be able to remove from the set estimate in order to predict the control input, to determine the control input. And I'm searching the sequence of control input that will lead to the largest reductions of uh, this set here in green and in yellow. For the H step ahead uh, prediction, uh, this follows exactly the same line. So mainly we contribute, we, we take into account for the field, uh, for the field of view, UAVI takes into account its all field of view and it takes also into, into account the evolution of the field of view of the neighbors. And we can apply afterwards gradient search uh, in order to minimize the estimation uncertainty to, to determine the, the sequence of control input. So now I will show some simulations. So the simulation here in that part were performed using uh, MATLAB. And uh, to represent sets, we use a polyshape toolbox. We could also use interval analysis, but uh, what we have noticed is that, uh, well, we have uh, large pessimism, which is introduced by um, the interval in evaluation. Uh, and so the poly with the polyshape toolbox, we are able to better master the wrapping effect and to reduce the wrapping effect. So I consider a search area of 500 by 500 meters. I consider three UAVs, which are flying relatively fast, four targets and four decoys. Here you have the evolution. So they are starting from the same locations and progressively we see that they are eating the yellow part. Here, the decoy was considered as a true target because it was not observed from the uh, proper location. But now you have seen uh, it was observed a second time, the, this decoy. And since it was observed a second time, it was observed from a correct point of view, which enables the decoy to be considered uh, really to be identified as a decoy. We have still here a decoy. And here again, it's not observed. And now it's observed from the uh, right location. So here, additional simulation results. This is the impact of the number of UAVs. Uh, here we have simulated 10 times. So we have performed 10 independent simulations. And we and uh, this is the area of uh, the um, set still to, uh, to be explored. Uh, this is the area of the yellow set. And we see that uh, with only two UAV, we are not able to, perf to, to get a significant reduction. We need three to four UAVs in order to be able to explore entirely the, the set, uh, the, the search area. This is also the impact of the communication range. We see that when the communication range is 50 meters, we get a much slower reduction of uh, the uncertainty, the, the area of the yellow set, than when we consider a communication range, which is equal to 200 meters. This is the influence of the speed of uh, the um, of the target. When the speed of the target is relatively high, again, we have difficulties to uh, entirely, we are able to detect all the targets, but we are not able to prove that we have seen all the target. You are able to prove that you have seen all the target when the yellow area is in fact, um, has entirely disappeared. And finally, this is the impact of the number of decoys here. And we see that uh, when we in increase the number of decoys, the detection, as expected, is, uh, is more difficult. So a short conclusion for the first part of the talk. So here we have considered cooperative target localization and tracking in presence of decoy using a fleet of UAV. And the main contribution here is to use set membership approach to deal with decoys. 
we are able to uh, consider three different sets. Here, the explore set, which may contain targets, the unexplore set, which to, to which targets may also belong, and we have a set, uh, the set in white, to which uh, we are able to prove that there is no target. So the further results, uh, considering moving decoys, obstacle obscure, obscuring the object, uh, we have considered the deterministic visibility condition, and uh, we are exploit. We are considering exploitation of uh, information coming from a computer vision system. So these are some reference paper. Now, Andreas, uh, we may either uh, start with a short uh, Q&A session, or I may switch to the second part. I think I've already 10 minutes left. Yeah, if, 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 if you want, uh, let's firstly answer questions because Natalie has raised her hand. Okay. Yes, thank you, Michel, for the nice talk. Just about the last simulation, you didn't, or I did not notice how many UAVs you had for the last ones for the communication range and so on. And for the communication range, uh, we, sorry, we have four. Okay, the last ones are with four UAVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last curves. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, let's see. Is there any other question? I have one more question. If we have time to 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 ask a yes. question. Sure. Sure, uh, Stefan, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Always uh, very interesting. Uh, I wonder if uh, during the MPC uh, optimization process, you use as well the communication range. Here it is taken into account. Yes, because at the beginning of the communication, I assume that uh, I know uh, that I have at time k, for example, that I receive information from uh, UAV 1, 2, and 3. And in the MPC of UAV I, I will use the information from, I will uh, assume that I have the information from UAV 1, 2, and 3. I'm uh, further able to take into account, I've not done this here, but I'm further able to do this. Uh, at time k, UAV I, for example, may move and uh, uh, get out of the communication range. And so in that case, I'm able to ignore the, the part of the information that will be provided by uh, UAV1, for example. But uh, the, um, the strategy does not uh, take into account more information. Here, this is relatively efficient to avoid having two UAV explore the same area. It's not that efficient to really coordinate uh, in an efficient manner the, the exploration. Clearly, some work has to be done uh, in that part. Uh, thank you. Interesting. Yes. Yes. The question was uh, using MPC. Uh, do you push the uh, the drones to keep uh, communication between between each others? I, I do not really push uh, or favor the formation. The, the fact that they will will remain in formation. This is um, uh, clearly if you remain in formation. If you remain in vicinity, when evaluated the criterion, you will have a larger decrease because you take into account um, the uh, exploration capability of more UAVs. So more or less, they remain in uh, information. Information they, they remain within communication range, but this is not always the case. Okay, thank you very much. Understood. Yes, uh, indirect optimization. Sorry, I understood that it is okay, in direct uh, op yeah, indirect yeah. optimization. But yeah. if uh, the drones uh, keep uh, in the same network, of course, uh, you receive more information. Yeah, and th this favors the thanks to the, the criterion that has been adopted. The fact that they, they remain relatively close. Yeah, let's see. Um, yes, I also have a very quick question concerning uh, an implementation point of view. You mentioned that you implemented your strategy with the help of Sorry. the Polish. You mentioned that you are implementing your strategy with the Polyshape toolbox. Yes. That does this toolbox has any advantage or specific disadvantage, for example, compared with the Quora toolbox by Mich uh, Matthias Althoff? Compared to the, which toolbox? Quora toolbox. 
I, I don't know this toolbox. Okay, the, the, the main advantage here uh, of the polyshape toolbox is that you are able to represent any uh, polygons, uh, not necessarily convex. You can represent holes quite efficiently and um, propagations of uncertainty, intersections, uh, unions are relatively easy to evaluate. And uh, well, that's not perfect, but um, it's okay. I, I think uh, one of the, um, uh, one thing that we could try to do is to have a kind of uh, either interval toolbox or a uh, representation using uh, uh, polytops for the set estimates for the sets in green, because the sets in green, most of the time remains, uh, they, 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 are, they can be efficiently represented by convex um, uh, polytops or convex polygons. For the uh, yellow set here, you see uh, this, is, uh, this is much more complicated to, to represent this kind of set using uh, something which is convex. But for the green set here, you see, uh, more or less, it, it, it remains convex. Oh, okay, yes, I see the biggest advantage, I think, is the representation of holes, because this is something that Cora, I think, cannot do with the polygon representation, yeah, yeah, if clearly. I'm not mistaken. And so here you see you have a union of several uh, of several ones, and uh, we, 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 are relative, we, we have relatively complex shapes uh, that have to be represented. And well, here when you see you have two sets which may fuse together, and uh, this is efficiently represented using the, the polyshape uh, uh, toolbox. Okay, great. Now let's see, is there any further question concerning the first part of Michelle's presentation? If not, just go ahead and continue with the second part. So, well, I will start not to be too long. It's okay for the slide again? Perfect. Okay. So now I will consider a problem which is slightly more complicated. We are performing localization of uh, partially hidden targets. We consider an unknown cluttered environment and uh, we are considering a fleet again of collaborative UAVs. So the main difficulty now is that you have the field of view which may be limited by obstacle. For example, here you have the shadow and uh, when you have a target in the shadow of the obstacle, you are not able to detect the target. So the presence of obstacles really complicates the task. And uh, you can consider a map of the environment. This is, this is possible. Uh, and with a map of the environment, you can consider the, that uh, you, you are able to predict the, the shadows that uh, will be cast by obstacles. And uh, mo much more complicated but more realistic situation is that when you don't have a map, so here we consider UAVs which are um, equipped with optical seekers. We consider an unknown uh, obstacle with unknown location. The target is detected and identified only when it is located within the field of view of the seeker and not hidden by the obstacle. And again, as in the previous presentation, I will try to develop a set membership estimation technique. So this is a, unknown, a typical example of an unknown, unknown region. So you have roads, you have buildings here, you have small houses, which are here. And I assume that I don't have any knowledge of uh, these environments. One strong hypothesis that I consider is that the ground is flat. So that I still perform a location in a 2D environment. And I assume that I'm uh, locating targets before my targets were points. Well, now targets have a shape and I assume that the shape of the target is unknown. So typically, if you consider an embedded computer vision system, uh, I assume that I'm able to get some images. So this is provided by a camera. I'm also able to get a depth map, DAK. So this is a depth map. You have several tools from computer vision which are able to get this depth map either from uh, binocular cameras or from a single camera now, it's even possible. I have also label pixels. 
here I perform, I can perform segmentation and distinguish targets and obstacles and ground. And I assume also that I have bounding box around the detected targets. Here, these are first bounding box, second bounding box. Here, I'm trying to detect cars. And uh, for example, you may use a tool such as a yellow in order to get uh, these uh, bounding boxes. So this is a typical, the typically the information I have, and this is far, far, far away from my observation equation, y is equal to j of x, where j is the observation equation. So the question now is, how can this type of information be exploited by a set membership estimator? And uh, when we have looked at the literature, there is relatively few uh, papers which are dealing with set membership estimation, uh, considering um, information coming from a computer vision systems. You have the work by Drevel, uh, but uh, not much more. So here, in order to address this problem, we have to introduce several hypotheses. And uh, first, we are I considering ca camera model. I considering a camera which has a given resolution. This is a, a number of rows, a number of columns of the image. And I assume a pinhole model without any distortion. Afterwards, I consider the light ray here, which is illuminating. Here, you have a light ray in red. Here, you have a light ray in green, which is illuminating the point x, y in the CCD array. I denote this light ray v of x, y. And the set of light ray, which are illuminating this specific pixel, they are denoting as this matcal vi. Okay. Afterwards, using the depth map, well, I need to introduce an hypothesis on the depth map in order to exploit this. And I, as this is where I introduce my bounded measurement noise hypothesis. Um, so I assume that this is the true distance that would be measured by, uh, let's say, a LiDAR, for example, a very accurate measurement device. And I assume that for each of the pixels, I'm able to obtain a distance measurement, which corresponds to the true distance, multiplied by 1 plus w, where w, this is a measurement noise. OK, I assume bounded measurement noise. And this range, the, the range acquisition, the, the distance that has been acquired, corresponds to the distance to the environment between the optical center of the camera and some part of the environment. Okay, for example, here you have this pixel, NRNC. Here you have one light ray. You don't know which one. And this light ray has provided the measurement here in blue, whereas the true measurement here is in red. And this is quite difficult because uh, you don't know which is the light ray which has produced the measurement. So then when you, what you can do is to introduce an interval which contains the true measurement. Here, this is an interval which is depicted in green. Afterwards, I assume that uh, I have a classification algorithm which is able to provide. Here, I've considered four classes. The class ground, here. The class target, in green. The class obstacle, in blue and some pixels which are unknown or not, not labeled, for example, here in black or in the border. Here you have some pixels which are not labeled because you don't know precisely what they are. Here I've, int I've introduced an additional hypothesis about the pixel labels. For example, for pixel labels are, are as ground. So this is quite complicated. But the main idea is if a pixel is labeled as ground, then all light rays, light rays that may hit this pixel are coming from the ground. So this means that when a pixel is labeled from the ground, the observed area corresponds only to the ground. The same for an obstacle. If you observed the classification algorithm classify as an obstacle, you get, you are sure that the light rays comes from an obstacle. And same from the target, you are sure that all light rays that hit these pixels come from an obstacle. So other hypotheses were, could be considered, and uh, the processing and storage of the information uh, may be slightly different. But OK, these are the hypotheses that I considered in this presentation. So afterwards, here, these are all the pixels which were labeled as 
uh, target. So these are the greens, the green pixels here. And I consider the pixel which correspond to target J. Here, this is target J. I assume that I'm not able to get this kind of pixel. So I'm not able to dis dis the, um, distinguish one target from another target. The only, only information that I have is that I'm able to get a box here. Um, this box here, which is uh, depicted in pink. And I'm sure that this box contains the at least one of the target, one of the pixel corresponding to the target J. Okay, so this is a weaker information about the um, bounding box, uh, which allows to uh, be a little bit more realistic because uh, in sometimes this bounding box does not, does not contain all the pixels uh, in green. What I assume is that this bounding box contains only one pixel, at least one pixel for the detected target G. Moreover, uh, if I detect target G, I'm able to say, well, this is target J. So using this information provided by the computer vision system, so I have an image, I have the segmentation information, I have the depth map, the UAV has to evaluate as before, the set containing the state of target J and the set containing the location of the target still to be detected. These are the green set and the yellow set that we have seen in the previous presentation. So in order to address, in order to address uh, the problem, since the target shape is unknown, I assume that I know a cylinder, here's a cylinder that contains the target state whatever the orientation of the target. For example, if you have a car, whatever the orientation of the car, I assume that I have a cylinder with known um, radius and height that contains the car. Afterwards, well, the, this is a pre, uh, proposed solution. If I consider a depth map here, using only the information provided by the depth map, what I'm able to do is to, con to, to identify here the part of the environment that uh, accounts for the measurement uncertainty. Here, this is this part, this segment, but also from the angular aperture of the um, corresponding to the pixel. So I know here that I have something, something here in that part has reflected the uh, light ray and has produced the measurement that uh, I've received. And using this, I'm, I will be able to characterize, for example, the location of obstacles. I will be able to characterize the location of targets and of the ground. Okay. So this set here is denoted by PIK and RNC. This is, it contains all points of X0, which may have led to the illumination of that pixel and to a measurement here uh, belonging to the interval that I've considered for the noisy measurement provided by the depth map. So once I've detected, um, uh, obtained a bounding box for a target, or for example, for target J, and using the pixel which, are, which were labeled as target and using the depth map, I'm able to characterize all here, these orange sets here, which contain, which have a non-empty intersection. The only thing I can say is that they have a non-empty intersection with the target shape, because here within this orange set, there were one point of the targets that has reflected um, the light ray. So a fi first idea would be simply in order to obtain an estimate of the location, I take of the target, I take this orange set and I perform the projection using this uh, the, the projection operator PG. I obtain a projection here. But unfortunately, with this, I do not get here, for example, in this example, and I am unable to get the location which is the center of mass of uh, the projection on the ground of the center of mass of the target. I'm not able to get here the, the location of the target. What I have to do is to account for the width of the target. And here, this is where I introduce 
the cylinder which contains the target. And uh, what I have to do is to enlarge here this um, projection in red in order to get the estimate. So this is my new estimate for the uh, my estimate from the target obtained from the measurements and from the pixel classification algorithm. Similarly, for the uh, for pixel labeled as ground, since all the light ray comes from the ground, what I can say is that within the area that has been observed and classified as ground, I am sure that there is no target located. So this is a way I can eliminate locations where there are targets, where there, there are no targets, sorry. So here in the simulation, I've considered a recursive simula simulation estimation algorithm as before here in order for the lack of time, I did not indicate where we can do exactly the same for the obstacles. And uh, we have performed a simulation using Webots for the robot simulator and the environment simulator and MATLAB for the polyshape evaluation and the model creative control evaluation. So I've considered the uh, four targets, uh, four, four UAVs, eight targets, a speed, well, it's quite slow, sure, is uh, one meter per second. And uh, well, I think I, I show a simulation. It's here. So here, this is what is observed when, by one of the target, by, by one of the UAV. Here, you have the result of the segmentation. Here, you have the set estimate of the UAV, which is currently observing the uh, area. In green, you have the location of the set estimate, which what appears in red here are the parts which were occluded by obstacle. In black, you have the location of obstacles. And in green, you have the updated set estimate. Here above, you have all the UAV which are exploring the area. And uh, the part that is in, uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, blue uh, magenta. It's the, the part that was previously hidden by the uh, obstacles. So I switch again to the presentation. So this is as a function of time, this is a cum cumulated number of identified targets. So uh, after 150 seconds, I'm able to ident identify more or less all targets. This is the number of targets here in green, which are identified. And here in black, these are those who are located in the field of view, but uh, the difference between the green and the, and the black, these are the uh, you, the targets that uh, were hidden, in fact, by obstacles. Here, this is the evolution of the target localization uncertainty, the average localization uncertainty. This is the estimation error in meter. So we are able with this to, to get an estimate of around one meter. And here, this is the estimation uncertainty in meter. So we are uh, an estimation uncertainty, which is around the 15 meter. This is mainly due to the fact that we have more targets than UAVs and we are not able to permanently observe the targets. And so the estimation uncertainty uh, grows uh, quite, uh, quite quickly. This is the evolution of the set estimate. So here in uh, orange, you have the evolution of the part of the area uh, which uh, has been, which is still to be explored. And we see that uh, we reach some um, floor. This is mainly due to the hidden parts of the environment, which is due to the, um, to the obstacles. Well, as a conclusion, here we have considered a CSAT problem where we are exploiting CVS information in an unknown environment. And uh, we have simulation with uh, Webots and MATLAB. As a perspective, we are trying currently, we are combining a 2.5D representation of the map in order to predict more efficiently the hidden area 
uh, to evaluate this in a more realistic simulator, optimize the communication and processing and consider as a type of LiDAR. I can briefly show you a simulation here that uh, we are obtained where we are trying to where we are trying to build a 2.5D environment of the environment uh, map of the environment. So you see here you have the building which are progressively growing. And uh, with this building which are progressively growing, we are able to predict the part in red, which is a part that will be occluded during the exploration. And um, our goal is to better account for the part uh, occluded uh, by the obstacle in order, for example, to design a trajectory which will go around the obstacles in order to more efficiently uh, eliminate the parts which are in blue here, uh, which has not been observed yet. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, and again, many thanks, Michelle, for your presentation. And now also the floor is open for discussions for the second part of the talk. Is there anyone who wants to ask something? Uh, in fact, I have one very small question. Mm. And the small question that I have is, did you also consider uh, strategies to identify not only, yeah, let's say, uh, let's make the yes, classification of obstacles of, uh, for example, the floor and yes, the targets, but did you also investigate the online identification of camera parameters? Of camera parameters? Yes. No, this is something we, we, we assume that you have camera which are perfectly calibrated. And uh, in fact, all the parts related to the vision aspects are idealized. The, the main contribution of here of this work is to uh, try to see which kind of hypotheses are necessary to um, exploit information uh, considered or provided by a computer vision system in order to be able to exploit them in this uh, set membership estimation context. And uh, uh, as you have seen, um, uh, all the information were provided by the uh, by Webots, which are the all for all information that uh, here. This is typically information which are provided by Webots. For the time being, we are not run uh, all this um, computer vision uh, tools that are necessary in order to uh, obtain this depth map, obtain the segmentation uh, and the bounding box. But, well, this is a, this typical, this typically the type of information we may get. So if you, if afterwards, you can, you, you could consider, I think Drevel, uh, in his work in 2020, I think he has uh, considered a problem uh, which, could be considered as camera calibration or could serve in order to calibrate the camera. Uh, what he tries to do is to get the pose of a UAV from known location of targets. And uh, if you know the pose, if you know the location of the target, you could use this information in order to perform the calibration of the camera. Okay, fine. Is there any other question? I may ask uh, one more, um, but for mm -hmm. curiosity yes, only, yes. I understand that uh, to go to uh, real experiments, the main difficulty is to have the sensors, uh, the cameras and so on, and not maybe uh, to fly drones. Uh, because you, you test a lot of things uh, using uh, this uh, simulation tool uh, we bought. But what is uh, probably uh, tricky is uh, to have the sensor and the camera. You confirm that, that fly uh, drones, uh, communicating uh, together, it's not the, the difficulty. Yeah, you, you have many companies which are able to fly drones uh, to uh, put them in formation to uh... Uh, this is something that is uh, already available. Here, the, um, uh, 
the algorithm, for, for example, in order to get here the um, uh, bounding boxes, these are algorithm which are uh, in the state of the art, YOLO, for example, all this classification algorithm, this are, the, the, you, you can also obtain them. One of the main difficulties is to characterize the uncertainty. There, there are relatively few results available for the uncertainty characterization. Similarly, for the depth map, there are also available results uh, for the depth map characterization. Uh, what you can say is that, well, uh, running all this uh, uh, computer-intensive uh, uh, deep neural network algorithm on um, platforms such as a drone, a commercial drone, uh, may be uh, quite difficult. It's right if the drone is uh, really small, it's less, it's more realistic if you consider uh, a drone, uh, 10,000 euro drone, for example. And um, uh, if you have only low cost drones, what you can do is simply offload all this computation, transmit simply the image, uh, perform uh, computation on the ground of uh, all uh, the, this information and uh, provide feedback, the uh, control inputs to the drone. This is possible. Okay, thank you. That's all right. I understand that is the approach you recommend uh, to do uh, experiments uh, in a lab uh, if uh, the purpose is to do a real experiment to confirm uh, all the nice results uh, you mm -hmm. demonstrate. Well, for, for the first part with Onera, we have already experiments on the, uh, the integration. Um, we had a computer vision system, but with a very uh, basic algorithm. For example, we consider uh, targets with Aruco markers. And uh, when you have these Aruco markers, you are able, it's much easier to determine the location of the target. You don't need uh, sophisticated computer vision algorithms and uh, you are able to get an estimate of the location. And in that context, we, we were able to obtain results which are close to uh, what you obtained here in simulations. And uh, for that part, for the time being, uh, uh, you have no experiments, only simulations. So what you explain, it is to put markers on the target to detect and then to recompute uh, the type of information uh, you present on this slide. So the depth map, uh, the segmentation and image. That uh, So with marker to have the truth and then recompute uh, the measurement needed uh, to run uh, the algorithm you presented? This could be a solution. Uh, in order to have um, experiments with a controlled uncertainty, uh, an alternative, well, is I think we bought this is uh, uh, not the best simulator uh, that exists. The main, its main advantage is that uh, it's relatively fast. You are able to get uh, uh, realistic information, depth map segmentation, images, you are also able to get uh, LIDARs, uh, information from LIDARs, but while well, embedding a LIDAR in a drone, uh, you, you, you need to, 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 to have a drone uh, which is able to carry a LIDAR. Um, but well, as you, as, as you said, putting a Naruko marker may help detecting the uh, in an easier way. An alternative is to use a, a trained uh, neural network in order to perform this, uh, uh, to, to obtain this type of image with the classification information. But what, what is really crucial here is the depth map. This is very important on the combination of the depth map with the classification. Okay, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what quality of depth map uh, you need to, to run uh, all the algorithms you present, but uh, I guess uh, it, it is something already available uh, on the market. Uh, in the market, uh, there are uh, small sensors 
euh, running for, of course euh, AI algorithme hein, euh, similar euh, to YOLO but not to euh, to identify classify but to provide uh, range range to uh, range to uh, something I guess for the, it... for, the, for the depth map we have considered uh, one or two percent uh, measurement uncertainty which is quite accurate okay Uh, if you have a lidar, uh, you get you can get uh, more accurate measurements. Uh, well, you can afford for five percent, but uh, with five percent uh, uh, for the elimination of uh, the parts which are on the ground, this would be fine. For object uh, obstacle detection, five percent is already fine. Uh, for to detect the target and to get an accurate uh, location of the target. Uh, This is more complicated. Okay, I understand that uh, the uncertainty uh, assumption you put on this map uh, are uh, quite important uh, for the performance. But uh... clearly, the uncertainty, the location uncertainty determines the width here. In fact, it's uh, this uh, uh, the size of the area in orange. The larger the uncertainty, the larger the size of the area in orange. So, an alternative to address this uh, issue is to observe the uh, environment from the top. If you observe the environment from the top, you are then less sensitive to the uncertainty. You are still sensitive to the uh, resolution of uh, your camera because this determines the opening angle, but you are less sensitive to the um, uh, distance measurement uncertainty. Okay, I understand. So maybe uh, to consider uh, one more drone uh, flying over flying the over. area and, uh, okay, maybe at high altitude, so... Uh, yeah, you, it... could, you, you could combine information uh, uh, with different observation point of view. This could, yeah, this is a very good idea. Uh, in order to uh, combine these two types of information. Okay, interesting. Something to explore, probably. Yeah. Okay, now this discussion has stimulated one further question from my side. Uh, in which coordinates do you describe uh, yeah, with respect to the camera, the obstacles, or the targets? Uh, do you use Cartesian coordinates or do you use, for example, also cylinder coordinates, uh, polar coordinates, or something more sophisticated? Yeah, okay. There are lots of change of coordinates. Okay. Uh, everything here, the estimates are expressed in the, um, uh, in the frame attached to the environment, but uh, all the range measurements are obtained in the frame related to the camera. So first, you have to convert from the frame related to the camera to the body frame of the UAV. And afterwards, assuming that uh, we have perfect knowledge, this is also a strong assumption of the state of the UAV, you have to go back to the, um, to the, to the, body fr to, to the frame attached to the environment. And clearly, here, another issue that has to be accounted for and uh, that is not considered here, is the uncertainty uh, related to the attitude of the drone. And uh, Maxim has considered uh, in another work, has taken into account this type of uncertainty in order to see uh, its impact, uh, the impact of such, kind of such type of uncertainty on uh, the um, estimation uncertainty you get for the location of the target. But, uh, well, we, we did not mix Uh, these two works because uh, this is already uh, complicated and uh, we don't would like we do not want to over complicate uh, the, uh, this presentation and this work okay great now it's the very last chance for the audience to ask a final question to michelle Since I do not see any raised hand, again, many thanks for both parts of your talk. This was very inspiring and I think very, 
benefit also for our audience here, since we have plenty of researchers working in the domain of path planning of robotics, uh, localization and mapping. And yes, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you again soon. That means on Monday in two weeks when we will have our next seminar. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Many thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.